Book of James, chapter, let's start in chapter 1. And um, Lindsay said something to me, and I don't, I have no idea, I cannot remember. I tried everything in the world to remember what it was she said, but it put me in mind of, of something. And I said, words versus deeds, is what I said. And I told her, I said, you know, I ought to preach on that. She said, that'd be good. So I prayed about it and asked God, and I think he's given me the blessing to preach on it, or teach maybe, I don't know. It's going to end up, the way God kind of worked all this out, it's going to end up being some lessons on hypocrisy. Not necessarily on lessons on how to be hypocrites. Because I think we got that down pretty good. But lessons about how to recognize hypocrisy. People say that they wouldn't go to a church because in their mind the church is full of hypocrites. Now, I know that some churches are full of hypocrites. So, they're not always, I understand that that might be an excuse why they wouldn't go. With some people, I have no doubt that they went to a church for a time in their life and saw the hypocrisy and assumed that that's how it would be and they got out and they won't go anymore. Now, some of those people, I have no doubt, still believe in God. But they saw the abuse. They saw people who said one thing, but did another. And I think the Bible bears that out to be the definition of what a hypocrite is. They say they believe something and live by something, but their life does not bear the fruit of what they say. And Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. I mean, they always tell us not to judge them or that we shouldn't judge anybody. But I don't think it's judgment to look at a pear tree that doesn't produce pears. That's not judgment to see what's obvious. That a tree just doesn't bear any fruit. Or it bears nothing but corrupt fruit. Good trees cannot produce corrupt fruit. Corrupt trees cannot produce good fruit. And that's just how it is. So, what this is going to start out being, and I, I have no plan on trying to get through all of this in one, one sermon. But I think it'll be good for us to sit down with our Bibles and to learn what it is that either we should have learned a long time ago but never did, or to remind ourselves of what certain of our obligations are if we say that we're Christians, if we say that we're saved, we say we believe the Bible, we say we are God's people, there are certain things that must be evident in our life. Is there not? And the book of James, there's two chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 2, that, that teach it. Say it verbatim and illustrate it. So let's start out in James chapter 1, verse 22. And then um, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll just move from there and see how God, see how far God carries it. James chapter 1, verse 22. Do you believe your Bible this morning? Say amen. amen. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 
So the question I could ask this morning is, is it possible for you to deceive your own self? People do it all the time. People in church do it all the time. They sit, they sit in a church and believe that they believe the right thing. They believe they're doing right. And, 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 you know, I understand a little bit about self-deception. I've done it. Where you lie to yourself, and then you start believing your own lies because you lie to everybody else. And God had me study out the human heart here a while back. And I don't think I'm done with that study. I think there's a lot more things I need to know. But why is it that you can have one billion people in this world who are, who say they are Roman Catholics? Some of the smartest people in the world are Roman Catholic priests. They have high education. And you would think, well, these, these guys have surely, they've read the Bible. But what is it about, let's say a Roman Catholic or somebody who believes obviously against the teachings of the Bible. And yet they have convinced themselves that only the Roman Catholic Church can save you. And that anybody else like us people out here, we're not Roman Catholic, don't ever intend on being. They say of us that we're all going to hell because we're not following the Pope. We're not going to the mother church. How is it that they can say that to themselves and believe it? How is it that you can have this mindset that you can do whatever you want and commit whatever sins you want? As long as you go to the priest often enough to have the priest take them away from you, you're still going to go to heaven. I don't understand it. But people deceive themselves. It's, it can be done and the very best of us. The very best of us. It's possible to deceive ourselves about certain issues in our life. I've done it. Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer. He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's looking in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And I think this verse speaks of something that I think we should all practice and that is self-examination. I mean, which one of us who, when they're getting ready to go to church, do not at least stop at a mirror, take a look. Make sure your hair's not all sticking out. Make sure your shirt's tucked in. You got the right shoes on your feet. You know how we are sometimes. We can be walking around with two different type of shoes on our feet and not even know it until somebody points it out. But self-examination, when we have our communion service, we hand out the bread, we hand out the wine, the fruit of the vine, and before you partake of it, we pause and we examine ourselves. Because Paul tells us very clearly that if you eat and drink that unworthily, you're guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's no way in the world I want to be guilty of that. So self-examination. But a person examines themselves. Look in the mirror. And then they walk away. And immediately. They forget what they saw. And that's what he's saying. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So I could ask you this morning, who would like to be blessed in what you do? Blessing is always about salvation. Always. Verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious. And bridleth not his tongue. But deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion 
and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Let me hear Bethel Church say amen. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's, that's our religion. And I'm not ashamed to say I have a religion. I believe in a religion. This religion comes to us from heaven. And it's defined in the Bible of how it's supposed to be. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's help. That we take what we're learning here from scriptures. And not worry about who around us is not doing what God said. Let's worry about whether we personally are doing what God said. Heavenly Father, I thank you Lord for putting this on my heart. And Father, help me as I preach it. To not be thinking of anybody else except me. I need to hear it. And I need the correction. Father, if you're going to have any use for me at all in your kingdom, I've got to stop lying to myself. Each one of us, we've got to stop lying to ourselves, believing our own lies. But Father, help each one who is with us today, who's hearing this message, examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. Examine ourselves, God, that we are not just hearers, ones that say amen, and then go and act like we never heard it. Help us, God, to do what you've asked us to do. Help me, dear God, to preach this in love. Help me to preach it, Lord, to edify, to be a blessing, to encourage, not to chastise, not to condemn, but to help. Because... I myself, from time to time, need the help. I need the encouragement. So, Father, I love my church. I love my people here and all over the world. I thank you for them. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless what we do and make us right, Lord, so we can continue to do what pleases and honors you. Father, there's a lot of people that are depending on us in this church. And Father I know for a fact God. That without your help. There's no way in the world we could do this. We wouldn't even be qualified. So Father I pray Lord that you'd bless the message. Bless these people and bless me. And Lord help us to be hearers and doers. We pray this in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen. Now in James chapter 2. Uh. He tells us then how this works, how this is applied. Uh, I, I have up on the screen verse 14, but let's just, let's just go down James chapter 2 today. And we'll let that be the message. We'll let, it, we'll let it sink in. And then we'll give out some of the other things in the scriptures kind of as we move along. But let's just make it our point to go through James chapter 2 this morning. James chapter 2 verse 1 James, now, who was James, by the way? Does anybody know? Yeah, the half-brother half of Jesus. We say half-brother because Joseph was James' father. But Joseph was not Jesus' father. Amen? Jesus' father was, had a different daddy. Amen? <laughs> this sounds like today. Amen? <laughs> hey, so if you've got families where they got different daddies, hey, so did Jesus. Amen? But that's who James was. James is speaking with authority as one of the apostles. And he says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. 
It would be wrong for us as a church to try to cater to those of a high class or those of a high, uh, high position or those who have money or those who have status, those who have power, those who have prestige. It would be wrong for us, as, and it's wrong for any church, to look upon people and have respective persons and say, these are the kind of people we want in our church, but that kind of people, we don't want them here. My goodness, look around you. Are there not enough empty pews in this place that we could fill them up with people that other churches wouldn't want them? In fact, we already have people in this church that other churches don't want them. I know this to be a fact concerning me. So we ought not to respect people's... This, this is part of hearing the word and then doing the word. We say that we believe the Bible. We believe every word of it. We don't question God's word. We ask, we ask God questions. But we don't question the authority of God's word. Whatever God's word says, that's it. That's final. God said it. And I believe it. And that settles it. Amen. But then, if we don't let the word of God make us into what we ought to be, then I'll say this, because the Bible says it in this chapter. You don't really believe what you say you believe. See, you'll never, you'll never hear me say, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you must be this, and you must be that. What I'm going to tell you is, if you really believe what God said, God's Word will do it in you. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. That verse where it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. I'm going to read the rest. I'm going to be like Paul Harvey. Now you're going to hear the rest of the story. Boy, I miss that guy, don't you? I loved Paul Harvey. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. So, we're not saved by what you do. We're not saved by your works. You're not saved. And God's not keeping you saved because you're better than everybody else. But... Verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. How is the tree known by its fruit? How are you going to be known by your fruit? And if, and the whole purpose of James 2 is, if you really believe what God said, then you will always act upon what you believe. Always. So, verse 2 of James 2. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel... And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Now, the Bible's not... Gay means happy. Frivolous. Nice looking. Not what the world has corrupted it into. And you have respect unto him that weareth the gay clothing. And say unto him, sit thou here in a good place. And say to the poor, stand thou there. Or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves and have become judges of evil thoughts? There was a time when if somebody would ask me the question, Pastor, what if somebody like in the summertime comes in? They, they've never been to this church before. They come in wearing shorts and a, like a t-shirt. Would you let them in? There was a time when I would have said no. No, they're going to come to church. They ought to dress like they're going to church. But I think God's changed my mind on that. If somebody walks in here and they're not dressed for church, I think we ought to let them in anyway. Now, whether it's a man or a woman, if they are dressed in such an immodest way that it is a distraction, I might have something to say about that. 
but somebody who doesn't know the rules, somebody who doesn't know anything about God, but God has sent them here so that their life and their soul could be saved. I think we ought to let them come in and sit wherever they want. Sit in your pew. Amen. I said sit in your pew. Where you sit. Wherever they want. Amen. That's doing. What God said. Instead of just hearing. What God said. So verse 5, hearken my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? Isn't that true? And heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. It's not the people that have that need God, it's the people who don't have that need God. Verse 6, but ye have despised the poor. And this, this verse 6 is dead on. Do not rich men oppress you. Look at your Bible. Are not the banks and the financial institutions of this country one of the biggest reasons why we are corrupt the way we are in this nation? Wasn't that 2008 bailout all about the financial institutions that didn't want to take a loss? So we had, ba we had to bail them out for their greed. That didn't help us any, did it? This Bible's right. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Here's what I know about rich people in churches. Is that no matter what position they have, they will always control that church. Always. Preacher wants to preach what God says. He's got to get permission from the guy with the money. Because if the guy with the money don't like it, he's got no power and influence behind the scenes. He'll throw that man out. I've seen it happen before. I could give you names of pastors that that's happened to. Verse 7. Do, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by, by the which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever. Underline this verse in your Bible. Underline verse 10 in your Bible. For who's... In fact, I, when you get done underlining it, we're going to say it out loud together. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Ready? For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if a whoremonger comes in, or a whore, or a sodomite, Or a drunkard, or a dope head, or anybody. If God was gracious enough to let them come to this church, then we ought to treat them the way God has already treated them. And be kind to them, and want them to hear the gospel. Because if we don't, and we sin in that, then... The question is, verse 10, is our sin any better than their sin? The answer is no. Verse 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And he's not just stopping there. That applies to everything. Everything. Verse 12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. There's the law of the Old Testament. And then we have the law of liberty, which is the new covenant. The law, the law of the old covenant has ten commandments. Law of the new one has two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And love thy neighbor as thyself. Just two commandments. And so... The point of all of this so far is, if I say that I believe the Bible, and yet I willingly ignore something that I know to be right or wrong, then my sin is just as bad 
as anybody else's is. If you know God told you, don't do this, and then you willingly do it, thinking that it's not as bad as what somebody else does. You know what we do sometimes? We watch somebody else sin and think they get away with it. And then we go out and sin our own sin. Because if they got away with it, we can get away with it. So we used to do that stuff when we were kids, didn't we? Well, they did it. They didn't get in trouble. And as, as adults... Sometimes we do the same thing. So verse 13, For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? Now here's, here's I, I've taught this, I believe I'm right on this. I've examined the scriptures. I've asked God to help me with this. And here's what I absolutely believe is true. If you really believe what you say you believe, then you will act upon what you believe in. Always. Now, if you don't really believe what God said in His Word, guess what? It is going to be manifested in the fruit of your life that you don't really believe everything that God said. It'll come out of you. Will it not? Seed always does what seed does. And if it's the seed of God's Word in you, then it will produce the fruit that God desires in you. We are His workmanship. But if there's a different seed in you, a corrupt seed, then the corrupt fruit of your life is going to be manifested. Am I saying that right? That's what, that, that's what this whole faith and work thing is all about. If you really believe what you say you believe, then you'll act on it. It'll just come out of you, you won't, and you won't think and live any other way. But if you don't really believe it, it's going to show. It's going to be manifested. Do we not, can, can we not recognize people that have taken so much methamphetamine? Cubby, you know what I'm talking about? Cubby used to, he could spot these guys a mile away. She's on meth. You know why? Because after a while it just takes its toll. Black teeth. Can't think straight. Can't stand up. That's really what that is. So verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. One of you say unto them. Depart in peace. Be you warmed and filled. God bless you. Notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What, does it, what, did, what good did you do? That is a hypocrite. That's a hypocrite. And we've all been guilty. Verse 16, or verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. And I... I, I I look at it like this. Under the Old Testament, you kept God's law because you were forced to keep God's law. You were made to keep the law. And if you didn't keep the law, you were killed. They even had a law for young people. That if you were a drunkard, a glutton, and disrespected your parents. For that crime, you were taken outside the city and stoned. You were not allowed to turn into an adult. That would have solved a lot of the jail problems we got right now. But those things were done 
Because you were made to do it. And if you didn't do it, you got the death penalty. The Old Testament was strict and forceful. But see, now the New Covenant. New Covenant comes along. And what God does is that God just takes out the condemnation. Replaces it with grace. And then puts a new man living inside of us. That doesn't obey what God says out of force. He obeys what God says out of desire to obey what God says. See, I don't, I don't have to enforce rules. I don't have to go after you. I don't have to go in your house and inspect your house and look inside your drawers and see what kind of life you live outside of this church. I don't have to do all that. It's not my place. Thank God. Because then y'all would be going, well, let's go through your house, Pastor Mike. Because I know that if you really love God, the new man in you just wants to do right. Just wants to. The new man inside of you wants to obey God. It wants to act in a way that shows that it loves God. It wants to, you know, somebody can say thank you, but then they, when they respond in a thankful manner, we know they really meant it. When I give candy to the grandkids, mom is usually there saying, tell them thank you, tell them thank you, tell them thank you. And so they say thank you. And I like that. But what I like the best, and I've got one, I've got one grandchild who is better at this than any of them. I'm not going, not going to dare tell you the name. But one grandchild always says, thank you, Papa, without being made to. Always. And it just makes you feel good. And when we do things because we love God, because we love our church, because we love our Bible, and we love one another, you don't have to ever be made to do anything. You do it because you just want to do it. Like, it's like when you were lost, only opposite. When you were lost, nobody had to make you get drunk. Nobody had to make you think dirty thoughts. Nobody had to make you cuss. Nobody had to make you do wrong. You did it because you wanted to. But now, you do different things. And you do them because you want to do it. Because you love God. You love the Bible. And you believe it. And you want God doing those things through you. And it just feels better. Who, was, who would raise their hand and say, I know for a fact that serving God feels much better than getting drunk or high. It does. It just satisfies you a whole lot better. So, um, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You can, you can say whatever and think whatever you want to think. But I'm telling you, it always shows on a person when they are madly in love with God and God's house and God's people and when they're not. It always, it always shows. Back in days gone by, there was a, a generation of men who, for some reason, it was unmanly to show emotions other than anger. And a lot of men never showed affection 
to their wife and to their children. That's wicked. That's wrong. Because if you loved them, it would show. You would show it. And it's the same with ladies, same with children, same with grandmas and grandpas. It's the same with everybody. If you really love, it'll show. That's what I, there's a lot more to say here. It's already almost 20 after. I'm going to cut it off here. I want to let you go and I want to let you think about this. I want you to study the rest of this chapter. And I want you to think, not about everybody else, but about you. Maybe there's some things. In fact, everybody bow your head. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. not going to ask you to come down. I'm just going to ask you, I'm just going to ask you a few questions for you to think about while your eyes are closed. Is there something right now in your life? that you know is wrong and if you loved God if you loved your husband or wife if you loved your children if you loved your church you loved your Bible you loved your neighbor Would it be worth giving it up? And maybe you don't have the power to. That's normal. Because you have a wicked flesh. And so does everybody else. But my goodness, at least will you not stop and think that while this is in your life, it does not manifest love toward God or to others. It only manifests love for yourself. Pride, ego, self-desire, self-fulfillment, that's all it's good for. And while you say you love God, you love your spouse, you love your children, you love your grandchildren, you love your church, you love your Bible, you love your faith. This thing in your life is hypocritical. And what, it, what it's doing and what God wants you to see in this is that you say you love all of these things I've mentioned, but you really don't. Not while this thing is just running amok in your life, whatever it is. And so today and this week, because God, God willing, I'm going to continue on this next week. God willing. You can come to the place where you can say, God, I am a hypocrite. And I say I love you and I say I love everybody else. But I certainly don't show it like I ought to. And this preaching and this thought starts at the pulpit. So I'm not exempt from anything I'm saying. So this morning, I just want you to think that thought while we pray. Father in heaven, thank you God for loving us enough. To be patient with us and teach us a better way of life. The reason why Jesus 
came and died for us was out of love for His Father and love for us or else He wouldn't have done it. And then for that, He is exalted on the right hand of the Father. And Father, help us to see that loving You, truly loving You, and truly loving Your Word, Your Spirit, the brethren, our neighbors, our lost family people, truly loving them, is certainly manifested in a much different way than how we're living right now. So, Father, we pray, God, not that we would take the reins and make ourselves different, but that, God, you would recreate us as your workmanship so that the truest desire of our heart is to not only say that we love you, Father, but to live it and manifest that love. Not just to say that we love our wife or our husband or our children, but to always manifest that love to them. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just open up the windows of heaven today. And God, you would do some work in our lives that shows that we really do love you. And we really are who we say we are. And no one can rightfully accuse us of hypocrisy. And our conscience would be clear. Father, I pray that you'd bless the word, not mine, but yours. And open up everybody's heart, dear God, to want to be different. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. God help us all. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet?